Good afternoon, and welcome to this week's Night Live Informed and Engaged show. I'm Lashar Bunting, Director of Journalism at Night Foundation. At this time in history, it is crucial that journalism have more veteran voices. While about 7% of Americans have served in the armed forces, only about 2% of journalists are veterans. The industry can and should do more to create a pathway for veterans looking to continue their life of service through journalism and to ensure the stories of veterans and military affairs are better represented in the media. Today, we are joined by three outstanding veterans who are making significant contributions in journalism. Zach Bador, Executive Director and Founder of Military Veterans in Journalism, an organization recently founded to get more veterans in newsrooms. Priya Shreeder, a political reporter for NBC7 in San Diego and Thomas Brennan, Executive Director of The War Horse, a nonprofit news organization educating the public on military service, war, and its impact. This is gonna be a great discussion, and for those watching, please submit your questions on the platform you're using to watch us. On Twitter, please use the hashtag Night Live. We hope to get to a few of your questions toward the end. Uh, first, I want to personally thank each of you for uh, taking time, you know, to join us for this important conversation. Uh, so let's dive in, guys. Uh, so at the start, I shared the statistic, right? 2% of journalists working in newsrooms today are veterans. Uh, I would love to hear really from each of you. What do you think are the biggest barriers for uh, veterans who, who you know, are seeking to break into journalism? Uh, Zach, I'll start with you. Well, thank you. And I appreciate you leading this conversation and the support of the Knight Foundation for our efforts. It's been really transformational. So I was in the military and I got out and I'll just share a, a simple anecdote to sort of demonstrate the need for more military vets in journalism and what media can do to support that effort. So I applied for a job with the New York Times. And as part of that application, I self-identified as a disabled veteran. I see that as a strength. But um, when they brought me in for an interview, uh, one of the folks asked me to detail my disability, which is not physical. So basically what they were doing is asking for my mental health diagnosis. It's not only intrusive, it's probably an illegal question. Um, there is nuance there. Um, you know, they were, I'm proud of my accomplishments and my service, despite the challenges that resulted from it. Um, at the same time, there's some shame in the labels and stereotypes that come from these uh, issues. Um, but more than anything, I think what that indicates is a culture that's, in, that's really ignorant about the military, ignorant about veterans, and for that matter, um, people with disabilities. Uh, to be frank, it also speaks about coastal elitism. You know, vets don't always go to fancy schools. Mm -hmm. uh, vets don't always, they're not always able to afford to live in a city like New York. Um, for an internship. So there's a class issue, class issue there too. And the military doesn't set its, its service members up for success in the transition. So there's a lot of systemic challenges that I think we are basically working to overcome. And the result is that, Nashara, as you mentioned, uh, veterans are vastly underrepresented in newsrooms. And I remember speaking with the head of a national news outlet who struggled to name three people on his staff who had served in the military. I mean, frankly, it's pathetic. Um, it's, it's a systemic challenge that needs to be addressed. And if I wasn't, if I was producing journalism today, I would be very reticent to bring these challenges to light because I would have to be making money and living. And I think it's my obligation now as somebody who's not running journalism for my income to call out these inadequacies and to work with outlets like the Times to come up with ways to build opportunities and remedy some of these issues. So that's what we're doing at Military Veterans in Journalism. We're creating opportunities through fellowships, and making these sort of things economically feasible, mentorship, career development events. And again, we couldn't do this without support. Yeah, well, we commend you for stepping up to, uh, you know, ensure that newsrooms address these systemic issues uh, that you talk about uh, that plague the industry. Um, Priya, I'd love to to hear sort of your thoughts about maybe the, you know, what do you think are the biggest barriers? 
Yeah, I mean, I think journalism is an inherently difficult career path to navigate. I had more of an unconventional story as far as how I got involved in journalism and then also the military. I was a journalist first, and then I joined the military only about five years ago. And um, I'm actually serving as a public affairs officer in the Navy Reserve. And what I realized really quickly um, being in the military is that a lot of these people in that military occupational specialty have um, a lot of the skill sets that we need in newsrooms. They know how to shoot and edit video. They know how to conduct interviews. They know how to write stories. And like you mentioned in the beginning, um, they have a desire to serve their communities, which is the same skill set and the same desires that we have as journalists. And so when I talk to a lot of the young folks about what they were thinking about doing with their lives when they got off of active duty, a lot of them hadn't necessarily thought about what skills they've learned in the military and how that could be translated into a civilian occupation. And the more they heard about journalism as a career path, they thought maybe this is something that I might be interested in. But I think for me specifically, um, landing a lot of the various jobs that I've had throughout my career, it involved a lot of networking and knowing people at the organization, at the different news organizations that you might be interested in applying to and working for, like Zach said. And I think that's kind of the brilliant thing about MBJ. I found out about them um, scouring social media and I reached out to them to learn more about their mission. And once I heard about that, I felt really compelled to sign on to to what they were doing because I think they're creating a smaller world where people who have had similar um, experiences to them can mentor and guide them and use their network of people that they know mm -hmm. to help um, guide them in the right direction about how do you build a portfolio of work? You know, a lot of the things that these guys are doing in the military, you can use those as, of, as examples of your writing and um, your storytelling abilities. So I think sometimes it's just a matter of figuring out what your skills are and then how to market them to potential employers in the civilian world. Absolutely. That's a great, that's a very good point. Uh, Thomas, just your thoughts on that, that same question, biggest barriers. Um, I, I think one of the biggest barriers for me, especially was uh, not having any mentors uh, and being afraid to reach out to people that I thought could mentor me. Uh, when I was getting medically retired back in two 2011, uh, part of my therapy uh, was writing. And I wrote a letter to the journalist who had actually covered uh, me being wounded in Afghanistan. Uh, and ultimately, I reached out to the editor that he had worked with at the New York Times uh, for help um, on just putting commas. I, I'm, I'm still to this day horrible with grammar. Uh, and and you know, he is still a friend of mine to this day. Uh, he is arguably the reason why I continued, uh, you know, writing um, and pursuing journalism, uh, and eventually, you know, publishing a bunch of stories with the At War blog uh, at, at the time. Um, you know, I thought that what the At War blog was doing uh, at the times was incredible. It, it started uh, many careers in journalism. Uh, myself, John Ismay. Uh, you know, T.M. Gibbons Neff. Um, I mean, like the list goes on and on of post 9-11 veterans that, that had, you know, got their start at, at you know, the at war blog at, at the New York Times because they made a commitment to, to giving veterans a voice. Uh, Jim Dow, who helped found it, you know, really saw uh, the, the value in, 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 you know, what veterans could bring to, to journalism. Um, but you know, a lot of people don't realize the, you know, the New York Times shut down who are you know, arguably the most uh, profitable newspaper out there right now, shut down their at war blog this year. Uh, and I think that just shows the, the broader commitment uh, and how it's just easily disposable uh, for, for, for newsrooms when it comes to veterans and military families. Um, similarly, the, the, the Post, uh, the Washington Post used to have a blog called the, the Checkpoint blog. Um, when war and veterans issues weren't a shiny object anymore, that, that got put off to the wayside. Um, so I, I think that the uh, lack of uh, of visible commitment um, to accurately covering military and veteran affairs uh, and ensuring that there's you know, insight on the staff from people who have worn the uniform or have lived close to the uniform uh, is is arguably the largest barrier um, because it makes people afraid to approach the the newsroom and become a part of it. Um, 
Absolutely. Well, Thomas, I, you know, I wanted to uh, sort of point to your organization. This seems like a good uh, place to talk about the work that you're doing. So the War Horse, which is um, also a, a night funded um, news organization, you have uh, published some really impactful journalism, including uh, recently a uh, recent investigation um, on how the culture of the Marine Corps silenced a victim of sexual assault. And also there was a uh, recent follow-up published today. Uh, I also want to point to um, a really excellent uh, first-person narrative from a National Guardsman sharing his thoughts and experiences from being at the insurrection at the Capitol. Capitol. Um, as I was reading those pieces, I noticed that there was a lot of depth and nuance in those stories um, that presumably is driven by the fact that there are, you know, veterans who are conceiving these stories, who are editing these stories, who are writing these stories. Um, talk a little bit about the work that you guys are doing and sort of how you're contributing to um, uh, increasing or uh, creating a better narrative and a more clear, nuanced narrative of military. Sure. Uh, you know, I like to think that the war horse is, is complimentary, not competition. Uh, military.com, Military Times, other, you know, uh, other military uh, focused newsrooms do a great job of you know, breaking news, opinion. Uh, we, we like to focus on, on long form uh, and, and investigative reporting, uh, which we feel is, is greatly missing from the national conversation. Uh, there's a lot of our reporting focuses on on failed accountability in, in the military. Uh, you know, the headlines today show that you know extremism and racism are at a any level is unacceptable, but it's at completely unacceptable levels to where they're you know putting operational pauses on 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 the armed forces. Um, the, the, there, we truly try to focus on the the. You know the more systemic issues like what Corporal U is facing right now, uh, where the the military has acknowledged time and time again that you know, she's mentally ill. Uh, they even approved her for a, me a medical retirement, um, but now she's involved in, in a court martial hearing that, uh, to say the least, is is being conducted without really any professionalism uh, or, or respect uh, for her as a defendant. Mm -hmm. So we try to focus on the untold stories where. You know, there can there can be positive social impact uh, mm -hmm. for the service members and, and their families. And how have you guys worked, you know, as a uh, news organization with other uh, sort of more mainstream uh, press? Sure. Thank you. Um, so some of the things that we've, we've done involve, uh, you know, we had a multimedia uh, project with Vanity Fair that focused on a Medal of Honor recipient who jumped on a grenade and survived. Uh, you know, there's other you know, big name partnerships uh, and projects that we've worked on, but some of the things that people don't know are that we also you know, work to support local newsrooms or local, especially local nonprofit newsrooms uh, who are working on ambitious uh, military reporting projects. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, Inside Climate News is, is one that we frequently help. Uh, they published a big package with, uh, I think it was CBS on, on climate change and heat injuries. Um, you know, didn't, we, we enjoy serving as, as advisors because we recognize that there is that lack of uh, that, that lack of the veteran and, and military family experience uh, in newsrooms around the country. Um, so until that's un, until veterans and military families are better represented, um, you know, War Horse is, is here as a resource for newsrooms working on those projects and who don't know where to go. That's excellent. Excellent. Um, and I encourage people to go to the website and read some of the journalism. It, it really is. It's really, it's really great. Um, Zach, you know, I, uh, you talked a little bit about military veterans and journalism. Night is, you know, we announced our uh, investment in that uh, back in the fall. Very proud to support that. Uh, and, and also the sort of origin story, right? What encouraged you to, to, to move into that? I would love to hear, you know, what have been some of the success stories? Uh, Thomas talked a little bit about mentorship, right? And the importance of having that as you're making that transition. Um, what are some really just good uh, examples of how your organization ha has been able to help both veterans and even newsrooms who are seeking to bring in more veterans? Yeah, great question. Thank you. Um, we are really proud of, of the partnerships that we've been able to build since we founded the organization in 2019. Um, for example, the Washington Post just announced uh, a military veteran fellow 
um, thanks to our, we have a great pipeline of folks just chomping at the bit, ready to jump into journalism. And so we're very proud that they've been they're working with us on that. NPR as well, dedicated a spot in their internship program, specifically for a veteran who's done amazing work with them. Um, we have a video journalism workshop ongoing right now in partnership with the Walton Family Foundation, Fujifilm, University of Mississippi, and a professor at Columbia University. So we are really excited to be able to working with a lot of different organizations who are dedicated to supporting the veteran community and diversifying journalism through involving and including uh, veterans. Um, you know, the, the big impetus, the, the big reason for it is we are underrepresented and we want to bring those things, these different opportunities to our community. So we have a mentorship program, we have uh, internships and fellowships, like I mentioned, we have various career development events, and um, you know, it's just been really amazing to be able to see our community grow. We have about 400 some members now. Uh, they're across the country and they are as diverse as the veteran population is. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's been a growing experience for us. We're very proud to be doing this work. And so for those people who are watching, who are uh, veterans eager to get into journalism or know someone, should they, how do they become a member? <laughs> Who's eligible? It's pretty simple. MBJ.network is our website. People can go and sign up. You don't actually have to be a, a journalist at the moment. You can be somebody who's aspiring to work in journalism. We work with most of our members are early career. So they're just looking to break into the door, you know, get, get through. Um, and uh, yeah, we welcome everybody who's interested and, and we're there to support them in their, in their career growth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Priya, I you, you talked a little bit about this at the top, but uh, I'm going to ask a journalist to talk about themselves, uh, which I know can be an uncomfortable thing. Um, but you have such an interesting journey, right? You first worked as a journalist and then decided to join the Navy Reserve. I would love to hear about that journey um, and how maybe that, you know, and approaching it in that way has made you a stronger journalist. Yeah, so um, it was pretty random, I guess. It was through one of my friends who I went to college with. He was enlisted in the Marine Corps when we were in college, and then he became a Navy officer. He introduced me to this program called the Direct Commission Officer Program in the Navy, where they essentially try to recruit people from different professional backgrounds to sort of augment the skill set that they have in the Navy. And so he had mentioned to me that they're looking for public affairs officers. And for a lot of the same reasons that, you know, the military also has to engage with the media on a regular basis, whether that's trying to, you know, promote certain things that they're doing or to answer questions about newsworthy events. You know, in the last year we saw um, just here in San Diego, we saw the Bonhomme Richard, which was a ship that got caught on fire. We saw the court martial trial of Eddie Gallagher, who was accused of, he was a Navy SEAL chief who was accused of war crimes. Um, we saw the Roosevelt, which was a carrier that left from here in San Diego, it was home ported here in San Diego that had a number of COVID cases. So in those instances, the military needs uh, people who can engage with the media and answer questions. So it was interesting because I was essentially recruited into the Navy to help in those efforts. And what I realized pretty quickly was that, like you mentioned, it was enhancing my own reporting and just broadening my horizons as far as the kinds of people that I was interacting with. And it definitely made um, my view on the world change. Um, prior to living here in San Diego, I had lived in San Antonio, which is another big military city. Um, there's army bases there, Air Force bases as well. Uh, here in San Diego, it's a big Navy and Marine Corps town. But just interacting with those people on a regular basis through my drill weekends and then also meeting their friends, they introduced me to a lot of issues that concern them, whether that was housing or, you know, finding a job as a military spouse. And I think especially when you're working in a news organization where a lot of your audience is active duty military or veterans, um, there are particular things that are of concern to them that I think the media um, we have a duty and an obligation to report on those issues. Um, I also think, you know, as Zach kind of mentioned, that 
it's important to have veterans in newsrooms, especially where there's a huge military and veteran audience, because you have people who are going to be able to scrutinize your stories at a completely different level than, you know, perhaps if it was just a civilian population. So I mentioned today that one of the big stories that we're seeing all across national media is the fact that, you know, the defense secretary said they wanted to do sort of a 60 day pause to look into potential extreme extremism within military ranks. And we're seeing a lot of conversations happen after the insurrection at Capitol Hill about the number of veterans who might have been involved in the insurrection and why that might be. And so I think especially when you're having those kinds of editorial conversations in newsrooms, it's important to have the military perspective and someone who maybe wore the uniform, who was on the inside, who can maybe give better insight as to what they think some of those issues are. That's great. Pre, you bring up a really good so, Sean, point. could I jump in just to Please. ask for that? I, um, I think Priya makes an excellent point. And, and I think sometimes people can view veterans as sort of being subservient. I mean, and they, maybe they wouldn't make good journalists because they're just going to toe the company line. In fact, I mean, I would say it's just been the opposite in my experience. Many veterans who I've, I mean, a lot of my reporting has been very challenging of government and very challenging government perspectives. And I'm sure it's the same for both Thomas and Priya. So I think when you, when you bring a veteran into a newsroom, you're getting that objectivity and the neutrality and you're getting a lot of questions and they really know the right questions to ask because they've been inside the government. They know what questions are really going to get into that. That's that informed skepticism is really going to inform their report. That's a really good point. Um, you know, what other skills do you think that, you know, that maybe you all learned in the military that give you an edge over other journalists, right? And, and with that question, also sort of in part making a case to news organizations that this is what you need and this is why you need us. I mean, so one thing I'll say also is that I think a lot of civilians sometimes when they look at the military, it seems really big and non-transparent and there are so many acronyms and it's like you're listening to a foreign language. And, um, you know, we I've talked about this with Zach a lot um, that, you know, if you don't know how to navigate that as a reporter, it can be extremely intimidating. So for me, especially now that I'm on the inside of the military, I'm I'm learning so much on a daily basis as far as, you know, what do certain terms, what what certain terms mean? And, and we've had these discussions a lot. You know, um, we hear oftentimes when we're watching news events that, oh, someone had military training. Well, I think it's important as a reporter to ask what kind of military training that is. Or, you know, we've had conversations um, about the terminology, a decorated veteran, you know, what, what does that mean? What does, what kind of awards have they won? What kind of deployments were they on? You know, were they actually involved in combat? What was their job in the military? Because there's a wide variety of jobs. And so I think even being able to decipher all of those different acronyms and ask the right questions and not be afraid of saying, you know, to the public affairs officer, perhaps that you're interacting with as a reporter that, I might need a different subject matter expert to help me understand this better. Um, I think it just makes the reporting more nuanced, like you were saying. And, and that's what a journalist's job is, right? Is to be able to explain complicated subject matter to the masses. Mm -hmm. So Priya, you touched a little bit on, the, on sort of this notion of um, sort of issues and, and quality of coverage. And Thomas, I'd love for you to, to talk a little bit about, you know, given all that's going on in the world, there's like list everything, right? There's a million things. Where do you think um, sort of the mainstream media is missing the story? You know, what are the things that they need to be looking at uh, from the, the military angle? Um, so I personally believe that, uh, you know, reporters get focused in too much on an individual instance uh, or a, a single case um, instead of, you know, taking a step back and recognizing that, you know, military bases are separated uh, all, all throughout the world, um, which it, with increasing news deserts, you know, makes it harder for, uh, you know, news of any issues to, to, to travel. Um, so I think that 
uh, you know, looking at the um, having a TBI moment and forgot your question. Um, the uh, you know what. What are the the sort of issues that you think that news organizations are missing? Those sort of stories. Um... Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> no, I think it's I think it's that uh, you know a lot of the issues that are represented at, at one that you're seeing at one base uh, are actually you know more more broadly representative uh, of the issues that you know the military and the Defense Department at large are facing. Um, you know I. I You'll see reporting that focuses on, you know, in the past at, at the VA, uh, you know, they focused on Phoenix and and, and that being a problem area uh, when really the, the the scandal was that you know, the VA networks across the entire country were, were facing that same issue. Um, you know, I, I, I think that part of why these stories aren't aren't looked at as more broader systemic issues is that because it, the, just like inside of newsrooms, um, the, the broader civilian public is disconnected from veterans and military families. Uh, and part of why there's such a broad misunderstanding of the issues that we face is because we aren't represented in newsrooms and we're not informing the public. Uh, so, so I think that, you know, we're in this predicament that, that, that we're in and people are covering the stories the way that they are because, uh, you know, veterans have never been, well, I'm not going to say never, but, you know, they're not represented uh, in newsrooms the way that they should be. Um, which goes back to the point of like, look at the systemic issue. Like, don't look at Fort Hood as as a singular instance and think that the you know a problem is only limited to that geographic location. Um, yeah, and um, I if I, I would love to jump off that point. Um, you know, it seems like right now, obviously, we're facing in the journalism world um, a little bit of a credibility problem. You know, you look at those Pew Research reports and it seems like trust in the media is at an all time low. And I think one of the issues is um, just like the military, where there are so many people in the United States who haven't even encountered someone who wears a uniform and that seems like a really foreign concept to them. Those are the same problems that journalists face too, where a lot of these people who say that they don't trust the media, um, they don't know a journalist, they've never met a journalist, they've never spoken to a journalist. And so I think like most things in the world, including politics, um, when you have more representation, it helps build credibility. And I think that when there are veterans on the inside of the newsroom, um, you're able to find that common bond and you are inherently going to trust them more. And I think it's always been really bizarre to me that it seems like there has been somewhat of an adversarial relationship between the military and journalists. Um, a lot of military folks I talk to say they don't like the way that the military is covered on news organizations because it feels as though they only zero in on extremely, you know, um, rare occurrences of bad apples. And those are the portraits that are being played, um, you know, on, on our televisions at home. And so I think if we do a better job as journalists of covering all aspects of the military, um, that's, and we have journal, journalists who are, were prior, you know, were veterans who are in the newsrooms who are telling the stories, that's going to help build up a better relationship between journalists and the military too. Uh, absolutely. If I could build on that, I mean, um, the, the, the level of combativeness uh, that, that I receive as a journalist sometimes from, you know, public affairs officers in the military, um, you know, there was, I think it was maybe two years, a few years ago now, uh, the, the first woman infantry officer, you know, graduated infantry officer school in the Marine Corps. Um, I pitched doing a profile on her because it's an incredible accomplishment. I'm a fellow infantryman or I'm a fellow, you know, infantry Marine. Um, and I, I wanted to capture that moment in time. Uh, it, it, and it was treated like I was writing an, it was treated as if it was an expose. Uh, and, 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 you know, I was exploring all different kinds of wrongdoing and, and, and whatnot. Um, I, I agree. If they, if they provided more access, I think that the, the, the reporting would be more thorough uh, and it would more, ac more broadly accurately reflect you know, the, the true military experience. Um, but because they restrict access so much, uh, especially when you don't know about the military or how to push back on that restriction, uh, it, it, it complicates people's ability to cover the subject accurately uh, and fairly for that matter. Mm -hmm. And I think actually military veterans bring a lot to the table when it comes to that because 
they are going to have contacts within the government. They are going to know how to navigate that system, as, as Priya said. And, um, you know, and certainly in my reporting, uh, I was able to pull and uh, a lot of strings basically behind the scenes to be able to get access to get information and have a plethora of sources, by the way, that spoke on and off the record. That's great. <clears throat> that is great. So, you know, I think we have to sort of go back a little bit, right? Uh, journalism education. Um, maybe you come out of the service and you're and you think, let me go to school, let me get a BA or um, or or a grad degree in journalism. What role can journalism education play here in helping to to uh, bring more veterans into the the industry? I'll start with uh, <laughs> I'll start with Zach since I know uh, <laughs> there's some work with uh, MVJ. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're developing partnerships with um, some schools. Some of them are working to provide training, provide that educational opportunity for to leave some with some, some vets with some skills at the end of the day. Others were developing fellowships, and uh, those are still in the pipeline, so um, hopefully some good news in the coming months. Um, I think there's a lot of ways that journalism, uh, journalism schools, other educational institutions can, can get involved and support veterans. And, and broadly speaking, it, they've been very supportive of, of getting more vets in their programs. It's tough. Um, some veterans are coming out of the military at different stages in their life and may not be able to um, study full time. Others are going to be able to go and, and live off of a, a basic allowance of housing that's provided by the Veterans Affairs. Um, so it really depends. Every, every veteran's path is, is going to be different. Um, and I think. Part of the challenge um, for these institutions is thinking about the different types of veterans that are out there mm -hmm. and ways that they can support them. It's, uh, there's no easy fix for this, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts from you guys, Thomas, Priya, on this issue? I, I personally have only ever experienced, uh, you know, Columbia's uh, in, involvement of veterans, and, and from what I, I witnessed, it you know seems to be a great model. Um, I'm not really aware of what other newsrooms are doing, hmm. or what other uh, journalism schools are doing. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think the best education sometimes can be uh, just hands-on, getting those internships and those fellowships, and I think that's why MBJ is doing a great job of trying to link um, veterans who have an interest or maybe they have the skill set to getting hands-on experience actually in the field. And I think once you see how newsrooms work on a daily basis, um, that can really give you a sense of what your potential role could be in the industry moving forward. That's great. That's great. I mean, really, there's a lot of opportunities for newsrooms, for journalism schools, for even journalism support organizations, which we haven't really quite talked about, um, to really step in, um, you know, organizations like uh, Institute for Non- Profit News. Uh, I know the National Association for Hispanic Journalists and others have have helped in this, uh, you know, <clears throat> in this issue. So, uh, so I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity there. I don't know if any of you want to speak on that in particular. Well, I think that you know, as the, with Warhorse in particular, and I think that uh, among sing other single subject newsrooms, there's a real opportunity to engage with the audiences that we serve in doing this. But we host, you know, writing seminars that are meant for people that you know, veterans and military family members that are, you know, coming to writing. They may have an interest in journalism, they may not, um, but it, it, that they're meant to make you know, news and and journalism more approachable uh, for people who might be hesitant uh, about a way to get involved and whether or not their story has any power. Um, so I think that. You know, trainings and being able to, to to pull back the curtain on on what newsrooms are doing. Um, the, everybody here has talked about how we need to restore trust uh, in, in news, and I think that you know we have access as journalists, and part of what we can do is share that access with the communities that we serve, so that we're representing them even better. Um, so I, I'm always a big advocate for for trainings and and us teaching people what we know, um, so they can understand the news landscape better. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll say one thing really quickly too. I get this question all the time about, you know, how to find mentors and, you know, it's, you can look up the news organizations in the town that you live in. And usually most of the reporters have their biographies on the news station's website. So don't be afraid to read those and reach out. You know, most of the time our emails are right in our biographies and we love hearing from viewers. We love getting tips. And I mean, the thing about this industry is you have to be so passionate about it to survive. So most of us love talking about news and we love hearing um, from aspiring journalists, or if you have a story and you'd like a reporter to pursue it. Um, the other thing I will say is that in a lot of the markets where there's um, a heavy concentration of active duty military or veterans, um, a lot of the news organizations will have a dedicated military reporter at their local newspaper or at the local TV channels that serve that community. So if you have a military story and you want uh, the local reporter to pursue it, just reach out directly to them. And um, I bet most of them will respond to you. Yeah, yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. The, the only, I, I believe the reason why I got into journalism was because I was willing to just ask for help that first time and, and to reach out to a journalist, exactly like you're saying. Um, so I, I would, I stand behind your advice as well. If I could just say one quick thing is that MVJ, Military Veterans and Journalism, we love creating partnerships and working with newsrooms, educational institutions, other nonprofits to support the veteran community. And, and I'd love to hear from other folks who might be listening today. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so let's thank you for all of that. Those are really great uh, tips and ideas and advice. Um, we're going to go to, uh, we have a question from Twitter. Um, so the Institute of Justice just appealed a SCOTUS case, a Supreme Court case for a vet assaulted unprovoked on camera by VA hospital police, they, they say. Uh, the vet himself was a law enforcement um, officer and he wants to hold the police accountable can't seem to get media attention. Um, how? What is the best way to reach veteran reporters? Maybe not even just this incident, but um, others who are trying to reach out specifically. Thomas, you might I, be a good person to talk to about that for you, please. Uh, I mean, honestly, you know, when I, the, I would think that the most successful emails that I receive that really Kind of pique my interest on on an investigation, uh, lay out some of the the, the facts and the evidence. Um, I, I mean, if if there's a video, you know, can, can we see it? Um, you know, is there are there documents? Uh, you know, documents are our sources. Um, so it, it, coming to a reporter, um, you know, with, with some of the work done, um, or at least an, an idea of what you think the story is, uh, is, is always a, a good way to get interest, uh, I think. Um, and I think that works for local and uh, you know, national news organizations and journalists as well. Um, the, you know, a, a three, four page email, you know, or it, 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 it's tough to get through. Um, you know, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean it makes it less of a story, uh, but if you're able to be succinct and help explain why it matters, you know, what uh, it, at the War Horse, you know, we're, we, we're proud that we fact check everything that we publish, um, heavily scrutinized. So if you have documents and stuff, it always, always, always helps. Absolutely. Um, so we have another question. Uh, and I, oh, this is a really good one. How has the government's treatment of veterans impacted your motivation to do your work? And how does that treatment create obstacles for veterans trying to tell their story? I'll start with you, Priya. Yeah, so I mean, I think one of the fundamental things that most journalists say about why we got into this business is to try to give a voice to the voiceless. And I'm not saying that veterans are voiceless, but um, trying to, you know, report on stories that people perhaps might not be paying any attention to. And I think especially when there's ever any examples of injustice, and we see it a lot, unfortunately, in stories about the veteran population who, you know, have um, risked everything for our country, not 
perhaps getting adequate treatment when they're coming back or, you know, having difficulties navigating perhaps the VA system or the healthcare system. Yeah, those are particularly um, noteworthy. And I think it's a journalist's job, right, to make sure that those systems that the government has put in place um, are working the way that they're supposed to work. And so, um, I mean, I've done several stories like that in Texas and, and a few here in California, and I think they're important stories to tell. I would say one of the biggest challenges in um, covering stories about veterans and the military is oftentimes their reluctance to talk. And it seems like it's sort of ingrained in the military culture to be skeptical of what a journalist's intentions are, even if we might not have any particular motivations. We're simply just looking into something or investigating something and we want to see what the truth is like how is this actually trickling down on the ground like when a real person walks through the doors of that building are they getting um what the government intended them to get so um i mean i think those stories are absolutely really important and again just like everything else if you have personal experience with the system whether it's through you or a family member or a friend then you're probably more in tune to cover stories like that um, because you're hearing about it firsthand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think for me, um, the a lot of my reporting centers on on mental health and and how poorly it's uh, addressed in in you know the military and veteran community. Uh, I didn't have a good exit from the Marine Corps. Um, I still love the Marine Corps, but you know, when I went through the medical retirement process, I got dragged through the mud and it was an experience that you know, drove me to my suicide attempt the day before, you know, or the day of my medical retirement. Um, so I think that uh, for, for me, um, stories about mental health failures uh, and, and knowing, you know, one of the first things that you're taught as, as a leader in, in, in the Marine Corps, at least, uh, you know, is to, to look out for the welfare of, of your Marines. Um, and I think there's no more fundamental way to ensure that somebody's you know, combat effective than, than to make sure that they're, that they're psychologically well. Um, so whether it's, you know, I'm working on a story about the, the army, um, you know, failing to uh, address the mental health of a, a soldier who became a terrorist. Um, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, we're looking at sexual assault stories that involve, you know, failure to address mental health problems. I, I think that, uh, you know, my personal experiences and then watching others be treated that way, um, is, is really a lot of what drives my work. Um, because we can do better, uh, it, it leadership 101 to do better. Um, and yeah, it, we, we, we can just do better. Um, and, and in a way for me, uh, having been the, the explosion robbed me of my career, uh, in, in the Marine Corps, uh, but journalism allows me the opportunity to keep looking out for Marines, um, the, the way that I got to do when I was still in uniform. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's powerful. Thank you for sharing that, Thomas. Zach, any thoughts on this? I, I drew from my experience. Um, in my, in, most recently, I, I reported and lived in the Central African Republic. And I was reporting a lot on the US military there, a lot on US engagement and other international engagement. Um, and so a lot of my reporting throughout my career has been on foreign affairs, foreign policy, and looking very critically at the United States and its role in the world. And so um, for me personally, a lot of what I draw upon from my own military service is, is my time in the military and that time overseas and thinking about our role in the world. So it's, it's absolutely shaped how um, I, I look at this and how I've done reporting over the years. Wow. Um, thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Zach, Priya, Thomas, uh, for the work that you do in journalism, for your news organizations, for your organizations, um, the service that you've given to our country, and also the service that, that you give to the industry and for the citizens, and keeping us um, um, so well informed. We are uh, grateful for all of that.
Uh, so thank you for joining us today, everyone. Uh, you know, um, I'm I'm so I'm so pleased to to be able to bring this these stories, uh, the work of these uh, amazing uh, people uh, here to everyone watching. Each of you is doing important work to lift up the cause of of, uh, of bringing more veterans in journalism and ensuring their stories uh, are properly told. So again, thank you. So everyone watching, please join us at the same time next Thursday for an episode of Discovery with a conversation led by Knight's Arts team. Thank you for watching.